Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Institute for Global Health Sciences Grand Rounds. Today, we have a wonderful speaker and a very interesting and uh, important topic. The topic today is about the indirect impact of COVID-19 on the health of women and children. Dr. Dillis Walker is a member of the leadership team at the Institute for Global Health Sciences, where she leads the Maternal, Neonatal and Child Health Collaborative. She's also a professor of OBGYN and the founder and president of Pronto. Um, she will be talking to us more about uh, Pronto and her work in Latin America, in Africa, and in India. It seems that um, all of the attention is now being focused on the consequences and impact of uh, COVID-19 on morbidity and mortality, but neglected is the indirect consequences of COVID, both in uh, healthcare and in public health services. Take uh, immunizations, for instance. Everywhere, the coverage of immunizations has decreased as a consequence of the distraction of COVID, just to name one example. So Dr. Dillis Walker will be telling us about uh, her direct experiences in Latin America, Africa, and India. And uh, Dilis, let me get uh, back to you now. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks very much, Jaime, and, and thank you all for joining. It's a real pleasure to be here and um, shining a light on an aspect of the pandemic I think we've um, not heard enough about, and we certainly don't know enough about. So, um, to just get started here, what we're hoping to do over the next half hour or so is I want to share with you a little bit about what we thought might happen to maternal, newborn, child, adolescent, reproductive health and nutrition. That's that all those letters up above um, when the pandemic hit. What we know about what is happening with regard to maternal, newborn, child, adolescent, reproductive health. And kind of get a little bit of a glimpse into some of the aspects of things we can't yet see, or we probably haven't seen, or maybe around the corner. And to give this a little bit of context, you know, it was oh, just over a year ago, and middle of March, I was on my last trip in India, and I was scheduled to travel from India to Geneva for the inaugural meeting of the stage group, which is, you know, um, strategic, um, technical advisory group advising uh, DG Tedros at the World Health Organization on maternal, newborn, child, adolescent, reproductive health and nutrition. And that meeting was abruptly canceled. All of these people expecting to go to Geneva joined on the phone for our first inaugural meeting. And not surprising, um, you know, this group that represented across the reproductive life course um, what was first and foremost is what, gonna, what is going to happen across um, the life course to women, their children over the next, as the pandemic comes to hit. So we set out, and what I'm going to share with you is some of those um, works that were contracted and what some of those things that are beginning to emerge. So let's just put this in context. We know that the pandemic is a horrible thing. There's been you know, over 150 million cases, 3.3 million deaths, and that's just you know, the most recent that I looked on it, and that's certainly far more than that. But in terms of maternal newborn health, I just want everyone to remember that you know, every year, 275,000 women are dying due to pregnancy and pregnancy-associated conditions. There are 2.4 million neonatal deaths and about the same number of stillbirths. So this is an enormous burden that doesn't tend to get 
the same hasn't been getting the same attention as it did prior to the pandemic. There's been a lot of, and understandably, um, diversion of interests and funds. And what many of us who work, focus more on the maternal, newborn, child side of things are really concerned about what this may do to some of the advances that have been made in the previous MDG eras and now in the SDG era. And it is really estimated, and this is not even thinking about COVID, that almost 50 million children under five will die. And probably across the maternal newborn, probably half of these deaths could be avoided with things we know how to do, pretty simple evidence-based implementation um, questions and approaches. So um, I'm not gonna talk about the direct impact of COVID on women and children. I just wanna sort of make sure we all are on the same page that you know, women directly are not at higher risk um, due to pregnancy. There's not a big concern about transmission or impacts on the newborn. They're, they're relatively resilient. Um, we know about children and adolescents. And we know that globally, even though women are at higher risk of in getting infections overall numbers, globally, but um, men are at greater risk from dying of COVID. So let's, you know, with that in mind, dive into what are some of the indirect impacts of COVID on um, in LMICs kind of and um, globally. So, you know, again, over a year ago, we were all concerned, what did we think might happen? And I think it was last summer, I spoke to this group and there had been this publication that had recently come out in Global in Lancet about a modeling exercise to estimate the indirect effects of the infection on maternal and child mortality in low and income, middle, mid, low and middle income countries. Again, this was a modeling study. This was all we had. Based on this, um, there was an estimation, and they, what they did, and you can see over here on the right side, a couple of figures. One is the impact on the estimated impact on maternal deaths, and down below is on child deaths. You can see the red is the differential additional increase in deaths based on different scenarios, one, two, and three. And the scenarios are based on different reductions in coverage of essential services, essential care. And they use this existing tool across lots of countries. And they estimated that in sort of this least case, least severe scenario, we would see about a quarter of a million additional child deaths and 12,000 maternal deaths. And in the worst case scenario, we would see over a million adolescent child, additional child deaths and 56,000 maternal deaths. So that was all based on estimates, and that was based on estimates of um, coverage. So what actually is happening? And um, I want to make sure to put this in the context of service coverage. The estimates, the concerns are all based on, um, on reducing services, and coverage in services can be impacted by you know, these four principal factors that influence that. One, workforce reductions. We've all heard about providers um, in all settings that are being redeployed to COVID units or not coming to work or are afraid to come to work or are them themselves sick. There's reductions in supply, um, distributions and supply chains for things like family planning, for life-saving, uterotonics to treat postpartum hemorrhage. So with the, the pandemic, there have been in many places some serious reductions in supplies that impact coverage. Um, there's access reductions. There have been some maternity units that have been entirely closed and reformatted as, um, uh, reformatted as COVID units. There have been some places, and I'll give you an example, where family planning unit family planning has just shut down and that's been the extra service that they decided they would not cover. And then finally, there are reductions in demand. Uh, community members are afraid to go to clinics. They're um, worried about getting on public transportation. They're worried about sitting in busy um, waiting rooms and that risk of getting infected. So it's basically these factors that together 
you could see how they might impact actual um, clinical outcomes on survival. And across the life course, I just want to give you a sense of what are those essential services that are important and how, if you think about that coverage reductions, what pathways that might be happening and what some of those consequences might be. So in the preconception space, we have the importance of family planning, contraception, access to abortion care where it's available may be impacted. For during pregnancy, the coverage during antenatal care and nutrition are important services that have been developed and need to be maintained. During childbirth, there has been huge efforts over the last decades um, to a move for facility-based work facility-based birth with a decrease in maternal mortality associated with that. And that, um, as you could tell that, you could imagine how there would be reductions in that. Early newborn care, growth, development, nutrition. Then you have the vaccination in childhood. And again, reaching adolescence, those reproductive health care services, um, particularly family planning, nutrition. So, what I want to do is just, um, you know, now back up the clock and see what has been happening over the last year and what have we learned and where have we learned it from. Uh, as I said, as through part of this WHO, we've been um, somewhat involved and aware of there are three relevant reports that have come out and continue to be um, updated. One of them is a large scoping review that measures that that has been surveying countries to assess the measures taken to maintain provision of essential services. The second is, and that's sort of broad, about 170 countries included in that scoping review that has been done twice, once last year. And then it has recently been repeated earlier this year to get a sense of how essential services have been uh, impacted by the pandemic. The next relevant report is this um, deeper dive into 19 countries. So the first one is much more a key informant interviews of um, ministry um, individuals reporting on essential services. The second one is a deeper dive into what is actually happening in 19 countries related to um, service, maintaining services or loss of services. And then the third one is this um, examining the effect of the macroeconomic policies on, um, on, on maternal newborn child health. I'm not going to share much about the last one. I, mean, I am going to share um, some of the um, high level information about the first two, and then a little bit of information about a country which we had the opportunity, particularly because of the timing of pandemic, to be there um, right during the thick of it. So, let me talk first about this pulse survey on the continuity of essential services that was done. Um, the first one published in August of last year, and then the next one just came out um, last month, which was an interim uh, report. It reports on 25 essential health services, and it's not just maternal newborn child health. Um, that's what I'm going to share with you. It really gives a broad view of um, the impact of the pandemic um, across um, healthcare services. And again, it was sent, the questionnaire was sent to about 160 countries. And you can see that the response rate, you know, just keep this in mind. There was, you know, 105 countries responded the first time around and 135 countries the second time around. I'm going to focus on the second report just to not complicate things. Um, and obviously, as I said, there are some limit. This gives you a broad view of how governments are reporting their services. This hasn't been really um, documented other than who the particular key informant was, but it does, does give you a broad idea of what, what things, what's happening globally with regard to essential services. So this is the um, focus on specifically reproductive maternal newborn child adolescent health and nutrition services. You can see across the left are the, the you know, the, the top one is what countries are reporting now. So this is really reporting earlier this year is the average disruption in service 
So overall, we're talking about a 35% reduction in these MNC, AAR, and H services. Um, this, if you look across the types of services, the number one is that is family planning and contraception, overall 44% of the countries. A management of severe malnutrition comes in second, which is 41% of the countries. And then this third one is important, the intimate partner and sexual violence prevention and response, followed by antenatal care. And you can see sick child services, postnatal care, safe abortion and facility-based births, which were have apparently, as the countries report, been least impacted, although representing reporting of, you know, 25% uh, report some disruption. And you can see the yellow is five to 25%, the orange is up to 50%, and the red is 50% or more disruption in services, which is significant. I will let you know that if you look at these totals, you know, well, what is it now or early 2021 compared to a year earlier or a few months into the pandemic? And each of these are actually a little about five points improved. So they're overall, the service disruption from a year ago to this year um, has improved. When we look at what have countries been doing to overcome these disruptions? Like what are the approaches they're taking? You can see that over half of these countries have um, reported community communications as important to that. And that's around triaging, staff recruitment, um, home-based and adaptation of services can, that can be delivered in the community or the home. And there's a whole series of a sort of novel approaches around dispensing medicines, um, addressing the, the, the supply chain, um, lots of people talking about um, telemedicine to replace in-person consults. And you can see a, a variety of approaches in, you know, and these are the numbers of countries reporting them. And I think, you know, it's interesting to see that, that countries are pretty quickly take, picking up and doing things rapidly and to some extent effectively, we don't really know yet, I'll give you a little glimpse into that, um, but, but systems are doing things for these. Now, I just want you to call your attention to, I, I presented earlier the, the maternal newborn child health impact and here we have the impact on mental neurologic substance um, abuse use disorders. And I, I was struck by just how much greater the disruption is in these types of services in terms of psychotherapy. Number, the highest number, 66% um, disruption in school mental health programs, not surprising with school, school shutting down. And again, some of these other services to um, people with mental health and other um, disabilities, much actually higher than the overall maternal child health. And this gets to a little bit of um, my thoughts on what might be around the corner. This is interesting because it's a comparison between case rates. So on the bottom line, we have the mean daily number of new cases per the population through the January to March of this year, and the percentage of services disrupted. And um, for me, you know, you would kind of expect that as the number of service, the number of cases go up, you would see greater disruption in sort of a curved or a diagonal line. And you see that that is not the case. There is a lot of disruption in services in places where there are actually not very many cases. And it begins to make you think a little bit about how do we more effectively work on this mismatch of, um, of service disruption and service provision. I said I was gonna, um, now I'm gonna take you to a country. So as I said, when this, um, this pandemic began, we were about to launch a postpartum hemorrhage um, project in Madagascar. And it was a capacity strengthening in which we were gonna do a simulation and team training um, program in Madagascar and Malawi. We were unable to go to Madagascar, so we had to quickly shift to a, 
a different project. And if, if you have interest later on, I can tell you a little bit more about the details and how we remotely managed to train and build capacity in postpartum hemorrhage. But the important part about this project in, in Madagascar is that we were working very closely already with ACCESS, which is the big USAID um, bilateral project, and Tandem and Societe Consultas, which are two independent research groups to, to sort of um, lead the research that we were doing there. And as I said, it's this implementation research pro project on postpartum hemorrhage. By chance, we conducted a baseline survey in um, January, February of 2020, just before the pandemic hit. We had our intervention and we did an endline survey um, earlier this year in Madagascar. And in that endline survey, we were able to um, add additional components related to COVID. And it was interesting because we, in the, in the baseline survey, we had a number of, of questions related to provider stress and burnout and respectful maternity care, which as I said, it's very recent. So we're continuing to an analyze this. So in that project, uh, you know, in, in Madagascar, as in with many countries, you know, the pandemic was declared March 11th. The first curve confirmed case in um, Madagascar was March 20th, same day that all flights were suspended. Now, Madagascar, as you saw on the map, is an island. So kind of like New Zealand, one would hope you could have um, really kept those borders closed. Unfortunately, by end of April, there were more than 600 cases a day. They had their first deaths and they declared a state of emergency. And since then, they had similar that we've seen in other countries, suspension of gatherings, travel bans, school closure, which happened, you know, similar to here. And you'll see this in this next, this, their, this is the way their pandemic has, has, you know, played out with this peak in July and come here at the end of last year, things started easing up and some of those um, restrictions were, were raised. And then there's been this second peak, which has been much worse than the first and the country um, is continuing to struggle. What I'm gonna share with you first is um, results from this survey about how the providers are doing. So we're talking about you know, a sampling of providers from 69 facilities. So a couple of providers from each facility. Most of these are um, smaller facilities, but a few of them are the larger. Um, the C CSB refers to the primary health center. CBU, whatever, is the first referral unit district hospital. And the CHU, because you'll see these in future slides, is the referral unit hospital. And we did this in two different regions. I'm not gonna try to pronounce their names for those who know me, know that that would not be very good for anyone. And then we split it up by doctors, midwives and nurses. And I'm gonna, nurses, and I'm gonna show you a little bit about how these providers are feeling over a year or a year into the pandemic um, about their preparation. So, you know, it's good to see that 75% of providers said that they were prepared or very prepared for um, personal protective, protective, protective equipment. They were, they felt pretty good at that. that. Um, and then you see about 6% were not at all prepared. And this is pretty similar, you know, across the facility level and across provider type. If we move on then to how comfortable they felt in actually managing a woman in labor with the diagnosis of COVID. Again, about 65% said they were prepared or very prepared and 16% were, were a little prepared or less. And you can see that um, this, is, this, is, um, this group here, which is the referral unit, this is the highest referral unit versus down here, which is the, the lower um, primary level, we're feeling um, more prepared than those referral, which was a little bit contradictory to what you would think um, more intuitively that more of the focus would go on the larger units. Uh, this is interesting because this is the reporting of, self-reporting of whether they've actually been trained on responding to COVID. Um, what 
you know, 44% of providers in the two regions say they received some training on how to respond to COVID. And that was how the question was, was posed. Um, what was striking to us and what we're beginning to delve into a little bit more in the qualitative is that there were more doctors um, than midwives or nurses reporting that they'd been trained. And I just, the, this difference between the midwives and the doctors particularly, when you think about globally um, the importance and the, of the role of the midwives and how many of the midwives, certainly in Madagascar and other of the settings, are among those that are redeployed um, to COVID care as well. And then here we have providers' fear of contracting COVID-19. Um, again, 58% of the providers, this is earlier this year, were very afraid of or afraid of contracting COVID-19. Madagascar is a country in which their um, leader had decided that the vaccine was not necessary for Madagascar and they weren't going to need it. So it wasn't until about a couple of months ago that the government made moves to um, get access to vaccine and now it is being introduced to the country but um, quite a bit later than in most parts of the world. Again, in you know correlating pretty similarly to the, the training, we also have the midwives a lot more afraid of actually contracting COVID. So those that are afraid of, of being infected are also those who are least likely to report having been trained in, in COVID. So now what about data in terms of what actually is happening to services? And I'm going to tell you about Madagascar because I have data that is most precise here. And here we look at the, um, we have the DHIS data that Tandem reviewed for us between 2019 and 2020. And then we have specific records reviews from institutions from the CESBE primary level. They provide 24-hour um, maternity care, a district hospital, and a referral unit. So we looked at two different regions, one facility at each of these levels. We looked at it six months, the data for six months before COVID and six months following COVID um, introduction to see the actual impact from registers on some of these essential services. So I know these are in French, these are very brand new data. So um, I know, I, I just, I'm going to just point out the trends to you. So interestingly, there has been overall a significant number and decrease in outpatient con consultation visits. So this, this line at the top is the overall number. The green number is the number from the um, referral unit hospital, um, and you can see, oh no, green, green is the, the primary clinic, sorry. Um, the, this is where the majority of the outpatient visits are, and you can see that over time there has been a dimi dim diminution of the number of outpatient consults. However, that decrease in outpatient visits is not attributed to a decrease in antenatal care visits. So the, you can see that this is this, again, the total number of women who have four antenatal care visits. One through six is the period before COVID, six through 12 is post COVID. And you can see that there was a dip right around March. So this is March that then pretty quickly has rebounded in the following six months in terms of antenatal care visits. Facility-based delivery, the absolute numbers decreased at each level, but it was not a significant change. So overall, again, with this little dip around when everyone was so anxious about it, was then supported. And these are actually correlated pretty well with some of these specific mitigation effects that they put in place to try to maintain these services. This is a little bit different story um, between at between six and 12 months. This little hump here, which has also rebounded, is the number of women sort of lost to follow up that were expected to return for family planning. Uh, this year, again, you, you know, similar story. You see this dip around this fair fear of what was going to be happening March, April had a big decrease in um, BCG vaccination for tuberculosis that also um, looks as though it has rebounded or is rebounding. 
And this I'm showing you is maternal deaths. Uh, this is from our study in the two regions with the, the six different facility units. And this is compared to the um, sort of the, uh, the timeline is a little bit different, but this is the DHIS countrywide for the number of maternal deaths. Again, you see this six months before COVID hit, the six months after COVID hit. Now, it looks like there's this big peak, but if you kind of, we're talking about six to eight deaths. Um, overall, and if you look at the country, this is January to December of, um, of 2020. You can see around here, it looks like a little peak, but they're also maybe seasonal. So overall, it doesn't look like there's a significant increase in maternal death. So to summarize, it looks like there were, a, you know, in, in the qualitative work we've done, it looks like there's some key factors that, um, that kind of explain Madagascar's response. They pretty quickly put in technical guidelines and in terms of treatments and standard precautions. Um, I think many of the providers were not fully trained, but I think that that certainly helped and they talk a lot about that, uh, the, the trainings that they actually have done. There were specific referral centers for uh, symptomatic um, individuals, so they really tried to focus um, the potential of infection and risk of transmission to specific units um, that had its pros and cons. And there was this constitution of this rapid intervention team that went, was quickly mobilized to places in the country where there seemed to be greater outbreak, outbreaks, the decentralization of the screening, and this volunteer program, um, I thought was fairly unique that uh, there, there was an active calling on volunteers and an active response to that request for volunteers. So this, how does this compare to what WHO reported in their survey of 19 countries? So I showed you the initial survey from WHO of a hundred, over 100 countries. This is the deeper dive from the 19 countries. And their, the, their surveys, um, the numbers on antenatal care varies by country. Um, overall, most countries are actually seeing that facility-based births are being maintained. And there is a decrease among uh, children's for acute respiratory infections in six of eight countries that reported to that. And the vaccination data, again, many countries seem to have that little dip right around um, the, the second quarter of last year that seems to be responding. I'm not going to go into this in detail because I know we want to get into the, the Q&A and discussion, but the countries, there are 17 countries that reported what they were doing to mitigate the actions. And you can say it's a wider range of things from these teleconsultations that I wanna, I'm gonna point out that a little bit farther. And then these were what the five actions that um, countries felt were most important. And again, you know, digital health comes up and comes up a lot in many, many contexts. Um, I think that the, the big point about the digital health is that we don't really know what is happening and lots of people moved very quickly to introduce digital health um, solutions and interventions. This publication came out just earlier this week and I think it points out some of the um, issues around this idea of avoiding the road to nowhere that um, many of the new digital interventions may not have been looking very carefully at these drivers of equity, the, the design, and actually how they're being integrated more broadly. And for those of you who are interested, I, I definitely urge you to take a look at, at this. Um, in terms of what we can't yet see, and again, this I'm going to close on this because I think this is really important. Um, I mentioned the, the, the burden. I think this statement by the UN policy brief that came out recently that, you know, the pandemic is deepen, deepening the pre-existing inequalities and exposing vulnerabilities. 
um, that we have yet to see what the impacts of that will be. Uh, violence against women looks to be increasing. Uh, we can, we've had many, many reports, and I think that this will continue to emerge in the coming months and years, and we can see why that might be due to these exacerbating factors. Um, many over, you know, 1.5 billion children are out of school, and what does being out of school, we saw a problem with the mental health issue in, in children in schools, but you can see there are many other issues that schools are safe places for kids, and um, we are going to see quite a bit of impact due to that um, time out of school, and this idea that um, Marie Stopes is estimating that 9.5 million girls are going to be prevented from getting the services that may be offered through the schools. Um, and finally, this idea that, you know, there are 740 million women employed by the informal economy that have lost their work or may have lost their work. Um, they tend to earn less than the men, they save less, and they hold more insecure jobs. This will impact not only them, their health, but the health of their family um, and those around them. So that's the end. Um, hopefully that's giving you a little bit of um, the impact of COVID beyond the actual number of cases and deaths caused by the illness. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Walker. Um, this is um, a really um, important topic to, to discuss. We have several questions coming from the audience, and I have the privilege of uh, sharing the um, dialogue, uh, the questions uh, posed to Dr. Walker with uh, Tanvi Gurasada, who is uh, a student in the master's program. And uh, she and I will be uh, sharing the, the Q&A. Um, let me ask uh, Tanvi over to you um, if you want to pose the first question. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Walker. This is so informative. And I think that as we continue to process this pandemic and it's, it's kind of longer term indirect impacts, this is the kind of work and research we really need to be thinking about. Um, so I wanted to ask, one of the first things you talked about is the impact of coverage reductions in affecting maternal and child and nutritional health. Um, could you expand a little bit on how the pandemic has led to workforce reductions specifically and how you think those reductions are going to impact maternal and child health? Um, yeah, and I can, I can speak from specifically in the many contexts we work, such as India, Madagascar, Malawi. Workforce reductions, you know, I think the number one cause for the workforce reduction is that providers are being redeployed. They're being pulled from one service to take care of either COVID testing, so COVID um, units, and that is pu definitely pulling, you know, uh, the maternity, newborn care is a huge part of a, of a service package. So that's number one. I think the other comp important components are that providers are getting sick, and they're out because they're sick, or providers are out because they're afraid of getting sick. And we've even had providers out because um, they are afraid to go to work because communities are thinking that they're infecting them. So they're staying at home. So there's all sorts of factors that are, are contributing to these workforce reductions. Um, let me ask you, Dilys, if I may, um, your first slide, reports the official numbers in terms of uh, cases and deaths, 3.3 million deaths officially reported, but clearly that is an underestimate. Um, both uh, the Economist and uh, the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation estimate that the real number must be somewhere around 10 million people um, that have died directly from COVID. And um, there's also huge excess mortality of uh, indirect consequence of, of COVID. Um, so that 
I can imagine is also having a tremendous impact in children, even though children might not get ill themselves. If their parents die of COVID or indirect consequences of COVID, if they become orphans, that is also going to surely have a huge impact on, on health for those children. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that is um, one of the things I think that is unfolding in India. You know, we have a, a project in India, so we have weekly communications with our team members in India. And something that, you know, has just been so tragic to hear to have, you know, these weekly calls where everyone has been infected or everybody has lost somebody. And what strikes me about the conversations with them versus some conversations with folks in other countries is that um, I, you know, hear these young nurses and doctors talking about their friends who died last week. So these are people that are in their early 30s. These aren't their mothers and fathers. These are going to funerals of young professionals, which shows exactly what you're saying. And, you know, in India, maybe it's just because it's just so widespread, but it also is because they have made a big effort to get vaccines to the older people. So the people that are, you know, getting your maybe, I don't know, I think the numbers, who knows, but a lot of young people are getting sick and dying in India. Can be over to you. Yeah, I mean, kind of related to that and related to this um, question of workforce redeployment during the pandemic, um, your the data that you showed us from the Madagascar study ha showed us a lot of disparities between um, training and like protectiveness received between providers who are physicians and midwives and nurses. And given that you talked about how the whole workforce is being reorganized and midwives and nurses are being deployed to do COVID care, what do you think, I mean, what are your opinions on, you know, how these kind of like the disparities and who's getting trained to be COVID safe and who isn't is going to affect the health of, of patients and the providers? I mean, you talk a lot about how important midwives are in maternal health and yeah, and thanks for that question, Tommy. I think that I'm, I'm really glad you point that out because I think that that's an important piece of this puzzle, not only in Madagascar, but in many of these settings where, you know, hierarchies reflect power and reflect access, you know, we're talking about access to care, but access to training, um, to PPE, to um, security around managing with this. And we all know that not just in, you know, it's not equitable the way people are selected to go get the training, you know, that's a perk to be able to go get the training. Um, where PPE is in short supply, it's more likely that your physician and or male is going to get, you know, first dibs. And I think any data that we have that can call that out and address that and point that out as actually something that um, data reflects will be helpful in in pushing those that are running those things to to make some changes. Dillis, is is your impression that um, not only outpatient uh, family planning services but obstetric uh, care uh, it, was there a shift towards uh, non-hospital delivery of babies in different parts of the world? What's your impression of the hospital delivery of babies uh, that many were close to non-COVID patients? Yeah, that's, you know, I think, and when I, I think back about what things I was thinking was going to be the impact of this, I thought there was going to be a huge shift from facility-based delivery to home delivery. And that, you know, in, in some ways that might be good, right? Some may that might be more what the women want to meet their needs. And that hasn't really panned out. That hasn't, the data, you know, and the data from those 19 countries, the data from Madagascar, you do see, and I probably will see that dip of that initial fear. And that probably is a reflection of home deliveries for whatever reason, 
but it's not maintained. There's a quick rebound. It hasn't, you know, there has not been a reset in where women have their babies. And that is pretty borne out in the, in the countries that at least I'm aware of any data existing for. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have a question in the Q&A that I'm going to jump to really quickly. Um, in your extensive experience, what health programs, campaigns, trainings, research, or TA do you feel should be postponed in the context of a pandemic? It's a difficult question, but one I think that many UCSF staff and faculty are struggling with, especially when dealing with rigid funders. Yeah, no, and that's exactly what we were forced to deal with, right? So we had this beautiful TA project in which we were going to go and, you know, transform postpartum hemorrhage care. And, you know, it was put on like all these things had to change. Now, we, we were pretty lucky because we had to transform what we were going to do and how we did it more than anything, rather than shut it down. And I think the importance for those of us, you know, I'm not a COVID focused, COVID centric person. I do maternal, newborn health, quality of care, but I also can't deny that my world has been transformed as well by what is going on in the, the rest of the health ecosystem. So for example, in the programs that we were actively working on right in this window, that were basically, you know, there was a simulation component to obstetric care. So how are we going to actually go to these facilities to conduct simulation and simulation training, which is person one-on-one, -on -one, and do it in a way that was safe for the people that were participating and valuable given that they're thinking about all other things. So one, we had to transform how we do it. So it was safe and there were masks and social distancing, and that was all practice. Two, we incorporated new scenarios that were directly related to COVID. So we integrated use of PPE in the simulation scenarios for upset, you know, interpartum care. We integrated, we transformed one of the simulation cases was hemorrhage to a patient that had COVID symptoms so that it provided sort of training, additional training in the context of COVID that was valuable to them. And thirdly, in order to do all this, we had to transform how we were supporting our in-country partners, we couldn't go there and train them. We ended training them remotely. So, you know, if anyone was in Mission Hall in the middle of the night in November, a number of, for a week or two, with <laughs> my colleagues, we were in there doing, you know, eight hour trainings in the middle of the night to correspond with our team in Madagascar, Malawi. Now, I thought that's not gonna work at all. It worked. There were difficulties, there were huge challenges. I would do it very differently, but we also can do things at a distance. And in many ways, it, um, I am grateful because it allowed this space for our in-country take partners to really take ownership and take over. Like they couldn't just sort of sit back. They, they had to learn how to do it and do it and they wanted to do it. And we weren't there to say, no, don't do it that way, do it this way. They figured out how to do it their way. And so there was a real benefit to that as well. But, you know, I think all of us who are, are in these spaces are having to figure out how to be adaptable, flexible, creative to making our work um, continue to be relevant in all these contexts. Phyllis, um you did mention um, the many other social and economic consequences um, in terms of um, wages for women, in terms of um, domestic violence, um, and also about the impact of um, one year without schooling for children. Uh, so all of those social consequences are just uh, tremendous and will be long-term, surely. Um, is there um, documentation about uh, mental health consequences, uh, violence, domestic violence increasing, 
Um, any reflection on that? There, there are certainly reports, and I think we're beginning to see sort of a surge in that now that you know we're getting through this acute report the epidemic and the direct impacts. A report on essential services and what you know, at least in my world, and I think this the emerging mental health, um, you know, gender based violence are things that are beginning to emerge. I've seen a few reports; they're fairly sporadic, but I will not be surprised if that those things, particularly mental health school things related to the, the lack of schooling and the gender issues relate, related to the decrease in the income are going to be hitting us for the years to come. And, I, and there will be much more um, information coming out about that. And probably that is not uh, something exclusive to low and uh, middle income countries. I'm sure we are seeing that in our own country in the US. Absolutely, absolutely. Can, can be. Um, perhaps we have time for one or two last questions from you. Sure. Um, so actually kind of continuing that conversation about the more social impact, um, I wanted to also touch on something that is definitely my area of interest. So I'm always like looking for is family planning and abortion care and the data from the Madagascar study and some of the more global studies that you were showing that showed that family planning and contraception services were definitely the hardest hit of these kind of maternal health services. And, you know, just speaking to your point about how those are not impacts you see right away, um, can you kind of predict a little bit what you think we're going to be seeing in the coming months and maybe even years in these countries as consequences of not being able to provide people with that kind of care? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and probably you're probably interested in that. I'd like to hear your opinion on that too. Um, but my quick thought, and then y'all, you can add to that, is that um, I think there's the negative side that we may well see increases in abortion related morbidity and mortality for the consequences of unplanned pregnancy in, in either in places that have access or don't have access. And um, and, and I think that that's something that many are concerned about. If I take a sort of more positive kind of twist to it, um, I think it may accelerate both the access to home-based self-abortion and self-abortion care. And some, you know, abortion activists have been able to move that agenda a bit farther. Like, you know, you don't really need to go see a doctor to get an abortion anymore. And that is a positive out outcome. Similarly, um, access and um, provision of family planning. You don't actually need one-on-ones with providers necessarily to do that. Um, there may be increased use of the self-injectable um, um, contraceptive. So I think there's, you know, there's a definitely a scary downside, but there's a bit of a silver lining that may help push some elements of this agenda. Your thoughts? Uh, well, really quickly, I love your positive spin to it. I mean, I think that there is a brighter future for self-managed abortion going forward and something that I really hope that activists and patients in developing countries can advocate for for themselves. That that would be really amazing to see developed from this. Um, my capstone research and stuff is kind of looking at the darker side, which is how increases in violence and um, just restrictions on mobility as a result of the pandemic and lockdowns has really affected access to family planning care that women are able to advocate for, for themselves. So um, in India, we're seeing a lot of people being pushed towards sterilization, which is a trend we saw prior to the pandemic, but one that I worry is just going to increase, you know, because we're not getting people the care they want when they need it. So that's where my head is at. But yes, let's end on a note of positivity, I hope we see a brighter future for self-managed care in the years to come. Yeah, we can hope for the best, but look out for the worst. Absolutely. And uh, with that uh, positive uh, comment, uh, I will just read aloud a, a thoughtful comment posed by Dr. Eric Goosby on, on this session. 
he says, uh, this has been a powerful description of the evolution we have all had to embrace as we move through the COVID impact on our programmatic footprints. The fact that we learned how we could do it from afar and document impact has been liberating in many ways, expanding access to virtual learning. So thank you so much, uh, Tanvi, for participating. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Walker, for a magnificent Grand Rounds presentation on such an important topic. Thank you all and see you next time. Thank you.